Thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Rules and City Government Committee meeting. Uh, roll call for the record, Alderman Arnett and Alderman Savage are in attendance. Uh, the first item is approval of the agenda. I'd Madam entertain Chief. motion, Alderman Arnett. I would move we approve the agenda, but I'd like to ask that we change the order. I'd like to move the uh, maritime task force up to the beginning of the meeting if uh, the if my colleagues would agree. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I think there's going to be more discussion there than I had hoped would be the case. Uh, Alderman, um, if the others are shorter discussions, why wouldn't we get rid of those first and then have the rest of the meeting to discuss? I, I, I may, I'm asking to do it. I don't know that they're going to be short. 0, 10, 20 um, has, um, we, we took this up at the last meeting, couldn't get, uh, we, we voted to postpone it. There are more issues that have come to the fore on that in terms of the nature of the notification. They've come up with uh, the Board of Appeals hearing that's ongoing and how notification has to be done. Uh, but I don't see any supplemental information that, that has been added since we were unable to discuss that. Um, the, this, I think we also postponed the excluded employees because we were waiting for more input, I believe from HR and I don't see that. And finance department, I think. Or maybe finance, yeah. So, um, I mean, I, I can move approval of the agenda, but I don't think, I am worried. By the way, we, uh, I don't think you were on when we were told we absolutely have to be off by 6.15. She uh, sent me something, so I did okay. get it. Yeah, yes, okay. Absolutely. So I think there could be a time constraint, but uh, well, approval of the agenda. <laughs> As as uh, then maybe intro introduced or amended, then maybe we should put a time limit on um, items so that we can try to get through instead of constantly postponing. The the um, other um, reason for uh, changing the agenda is we have outside participants who are now connected and are are standing by. I don't think they're for the other items on the agenda. Okay, I, I assume, however, that staff will be on um, Dr. Nash as well as um, Ms. Hopkins. But um, I'm fine. Is, is your motion standing to um, move R46 to the front of the agenda? It is. Sir, second? I'll second that. Okay, um, I'm fine with that it. I just want to make sure that, <laughs> that we, um, you know, get through the work of the committee and not continuously have to postpone because we do have to be finished by 6:15. So um, the motion is to for approval of the agenda, moving R4620 to the head of the list. Uh, all in favor of approving the agenda as amended, please say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Approval of the minutes is the next business from Move our September 8th meeting. Move approval of the minutes. Second. Okay. I want I'll whatever approve. mellow stuff Rob is on. I mean, <laughs> the, he is kicked it's back. The, it's the chair. <laughs> it's the chair. It makes a difference, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. Um, Move to the motion is to approve the minutes as written. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, so we're going to the legislation before the committee and we're going to R46, the Maritime Task Force, for the purpose of establishing a Maritime Task Force charged with conducting a comprehensive review of the waterfront maritime zoning districts of the city of Annapolis and on and on. Uh, Alderman, this is your legislation. So do you want to start uh, by speaking to it? Yes, if I may, thank you. Um, so <clears throat> uh, this is um, in part a response to 
some other legislation I had that had to do with uh, amendments to the uh, WMM zone, which I have subsequently withdrawn in favor of the task force. And I've been working with uh, planning and zoning and uh, with Eileen Fogarty, you can see on the, but also I've been getting a lot, a lot of input from many different sources. And um, it primarily focuses with the uh, item, if you look at the legislation itself on page three, that has to do with the composition of the task force. But in discussing the composition, it has, to my mind, um, brought to the fore that the uh, task force um, may be uh, overly broad or overly ambitious. Um, in my mind, as conceived, the task force had three missions. One was a long overdue 38 years review of the um, maritime zoning legislation. And we're lucky to have Eileen with us because she was the uh, person who shepherded that through, but it uh, things have changed. The second one was to look at the overall health of the maritime industry, which going into the development of the legislation was uh, flagging recently with the COVID. One of the side effects of that is boat sales have gone through the roof. Um, and the reason for that is people feel secure out on the water, but that brings into for attention on getting maritime services for the boats, either for those of us who live in the city, um, but also for those who visit the city as uh, boating visitors. And then the third issue, which is also topical and had his, has its own life, was this access to the water issue and then safety on the water, which really came to the fore with um, the whole South Annapolis Yachting Center harbor line change and worries about paddle borders in the same lane, traffic lanes as uh, power boats and sailboats. Um, <clears throat> it made sense to bring all those together to me and it may still make sense, but um, I, I'm really beginning to feel that we need to think about these as three, at least three discrete activities. And that brings me to uh, thinking about the composition of the task force or potentially as a steering committee for three sub task force groupings. But uh, as the code reads now, there are, there's the Maritime Advisory Board, one resident from each of the uh, abutting maritime zones, which it turns out I abut two of them, the WMM and the WME. So does that mean I get two citizens, Rob gets one and Ellie gets one? And we've already heard from council members uh, who have become co-sponsors of the legislation, Rhonda and Dewan, uh, that they want to have citizens on the committee <clears throat> because of the access to the water issue, not necessarily the zoning issue or the maritime in industry issue. Uh, and then there have been, there's been input about proper representation of maritime owners, and then a distinction between maritime businesses, which I guess are as distinct from maritime owners and maritime tenants, uh, and then a whole bunch of other things. So I sent you all an email that was forwarding an email from Eileen that proposed maritime for maritime property owners, for maritime business owners, um, for maritime industry tenants, for residents, and then for public interest groups which could include maritime envirs, uh, environment, uh, the maritime uh, advisory board member, maritime trades association, river keeper slash environment, maritime museum and seafarers. Um, doesn't include input that I've gotten from maritime yacht clubs, which is still another entity. So I'm raising all of these complications to 
seek um, your advice about whether we're really ready to proceed at this point. And if we are, uh, should we be thinking more about a task force steering committee and then three and, and being explicit about having at least three subgroups? Um, <clears throat> I want to mention in discussions, and I'm, the mayor has been very attentive to this. So, so is Dr. Nash, Eileen, and the city manager. So this is really a, a fairly important thing. Um, you don't have to be on the task force to have opportunity to participate. And I think that we do need to be working, uh, thinking about having the task force have flexibility so I'm not interested, you know, some of my concerns about the um, workforce housing group that has 45 members of the affordable housing group. I'm, I'm really interested in a task force that can be representative, but still be functional. Uh, and I think about things like quorums. If you have a 45 member uh, task force like the affordable housing does that mean that your quorum is 24 or 23 members? And how many t times do we think we'll really get that? Um, so forth. So I'm, I'm jumping right into the meat of this. As far as the rest of the resolution, I think it's really pretty straightforward. I think the meaty issue, and I think issues that Terry and Phil are here to talk about also. And um, I think Jim Nolan wanted to be on here, he may join us. Um, but I'm glad that Eileen is here because she knows how much time we've spent noodling this around. And I'm um, suggesting that we need, need your help <laughs> uh, noodling this through. Terry just sent us all an interesting email that um, brings up some issues that I also want to talk about, but it brings up issues about the <coughs> representation <coughs> on the task force and Phil has been bringing up issues. So uh, I'm setting the stage for what I think is the primary area of discussion uh, as we think about the rules committee recommendation on the task force. Um, Alderman, I, I'm, I think back to what you would be saying as a result of this description. And that would be that, is this really ready for us to address? This is your legislation and you just went through a litany of issues about why it's not ready. So do you have amendments for us to consider mm -hmm. or do you wanna use the time just to have a dialogue about um, what? might be, we need, you know. I do have amendments and that was, uh, my amendments are the email that uh, I forwarded you from Eileen, which is that it we have four maritime property owners, four business owners, four industry tenants, four residents, and possibly five uh, at large resident, and then four people representing the public interest, which includes <clears throat> um, maritime environment, uh, maritime trade associations, uh, and maritime museum, and possibly some of the yacht clubs. But I know that, uh, so I, I'm, I'm agreeing with you, this may not be ready for prime time, but I think it would be valuable to hear from both Phil and Terry um, to see if they can help uh, bring some result, and Eileen, of course. I'd like to chime result. in too. <laughs> and, and Rob, yeah. Well, oh, well, you're, just, you're just on the committee. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna call on the committee member first. So Rob. Thank you. I, um, I'm not seeing you, but. I know, I'm I trying to find a good place to uh, land here. Um, Are you okay? There I am, <laughs> yeah. A doorbell rang, of course, and then that set the dogs off. Um, <laughs> the challenges of remote meeting. Um, now I'm out of breath. So, yeah, I, <laughs> Ross, I think you kind of raised a lot, but I mean, I'm inclined to just amend it rather than 
starting over. I think what we have is pretty good and I don't see why we can't just tweak it. Um, in terms of the composition, uh, I, you mentioned the alder persons, but it doesn't look like we get any kind of specific appointment mm -hmm. to this, right? You're on mute, Ross. It looks like it's the, uh, the mayor appoints, but the waterside aldermen advise. That's how the resolution reads. And I I'm fine with that. Uh, but I do want to speak on behalf of both Rhonda and Dewan, uh, and I'm glad that they're interested in this, um, but they both, Rhonda has already given me the name of the person that she wants to be on here. She's not one of the older persons abutting the water, but we are talking about issues that are broader wow. than abutting the water, both in terms of things like maritime businesses like Fawcett's and West Marine who are also not on the water, but also this whole issue of access to and safety on the water, which access, as you know, is a big burning issue and has a lot of social aspects to it uh, that are over and above maritime. Right. Well, I mean, I can appreciate that, but I, I'm kind of curious what the chair thinks, but, um, I mean, while I think the non-waterfront wars are certainly indirectly impacted, um, I feel like it really directly impacts those of us who have these zoning in our wards. And uh, yeah, I think the rest of the council is gonna get a say on whatever comes out of this task force anyway, right? It's gonna be the form of some kind of legislation. So I think that's the time really for the other wards to chime in. And this um, will go to the planning commission as well. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I can chime in right now to say that I would join Alderman, Alderwoman Charles and Alderman Gay uh, in insisting that we all have a representative. You have many, many representatives on this committee and uh, some in duplicate. Um, and I think every alderman, whether they are on the water or not, should have a representation because it belongs to everybody. Um, and Alderman Savage just made a good point. How many maritime businesses do we have that aren't on the water? Um, so anyway, but that's only one piece of it. Um, so Alderman, um, do you want to um, give, I'm sorry, will you finish Rob? Uh, uh, let me see. Yeah, Rob, right? Yeah, um, let me find my notes again. Um, Oh, well, the other question I guess I have just from looking at the fiscal impact statement is it looks like there is going to be a, it's saying that there's an impact of $25,000 plan zoning to hire a consultant. They said that was included in the fiscal year 21 budget. Um, I'm guessing that's coming from some other pool of consultant money that we have in plan zoning, maybe for comp plan or something else, but I'm, I'm just kind of curious about that information. I know that's not necessarily uh, related to the content of the legislation itself, but um, I do have that question. But I mean, my, my read through the legislation was uh, nothing really jumped out at me. Uh, I think we do need to clarify representation from the um, council. Uh, I think that can potentially get kind of messy and might make this pretty large um, task force. <laughs> um, so that's what I'm worried about in that regard. But you know, that, that's basically all I have to say at the moment about it. Well then, thank you, Alderman. Let's uh, give our guest an opportunity to speak now. Um, I think with the understanding, Alderman Arnett, that you're gonna come back to us with some amendments. Um, because we need something in proper form in front of us uh, if we're going to, you know, vote on them. So uh, would you like to begin with uh, Mr. Lomax, who's the chair of the Maritime Advisory Board? That, that's fine with Lomax if it's fine with the, with the, uh, the council members. Yes, it's fine with us. Thank you. <laughs> I, sent, um, I sent each of you and then copied a number of others an email earlier today, uh, actually about 3.30, that sort of outlined um, my thinking on this. Um, and 
to echo what Alderman Arnett said, um, it is clear that there are multiple objectives, all of which are laudable objectives, but there are, uh, they are somewhat divergent uh, in the proposed for the task force to look at. And in my mind, as chair of the Maritime Advisory Board and, and also personally, the primary purpose that we went down this path with the task force, or, and I've talked with Alderman Arnett a number of times, uh, is the fact that the zones have been unbalanced in terms of, or inequitable, I guess is the better word, for the, since 1987. They are not a level playing field across the board. Uh, WMI and WME have no provision for non-maritime uh, uses, whereas WMM does, and that creates an, uh, an imbalance. Likewise, restaurants, or lack thereof in WMI, create an imbalance, and there are others. The second thing that's happened in the last 35 years is clearly the maritime industry is not what it was in 1987. Uh, 1987 was an era of working boat yards lining the lining the shoreline, um, and we are no longer we are limited with working boat yards. We have instead more um, recreational marina uses rather than um, uh, commercial. So. What I did was kind of parse this out into the three panel to the th three goals and looked at what would be an appropriate um, uh, makeup for the three goals. And the first is for the zoning review, it's it's the, it's the business members that are in those zones that have the primar primarily their livelihood is what's being affected by this unlevel playing field. Uh, yes, there are abutting residents that should have an input so that, that the ch any change in uses doesn't, uh, is, isn't inconsistent with uh, the, the um, mixed use of the neighborhoods. But that, that particular aspect of the task force uh, goal should be separate and distinct uh, in terms of the people considering it and, and focused on those whose livelihood is gonna be affected. The second goal, uh, which is the broader industry view, review, um, recognizes that there are a maritime interests, I think as Alderman Finlayson, you pointed out, throughout the city, and they in turn um, have their own unique uh, needs, I'll, I'll, I'll say, uh, and they are in zones that are not necessarily WM zones, and they may or may not have um, there may or may not be uses that might want to be affected in some of those zones, but certainly they should be part, part of the broader picture. And in particular on the fact that the broader economic aspect of the maritime industry, as Alderman Arnett pointed out, uh, you know, affects all, all the maritime businesses in the city. And that in those, uh, with those uh, businesses, certainly the makeup of the members that are going to be discussing and considering their um, that aspect probably should be expanded to representatives from outside the maritime zones, uh, from the various wards uh, that have other maritime businesses, or perhaps all wards. Then you get the larger the larger public interest uh, in water access issue. And that is an issue that fairly cuts across all of the aldermanic districts because it's not just the fact that people in maritime zones use the water, but there are, as I point out in my email, there are, you've got Truxton Park that should be looked at just if nothing else from an infrastructure perspective. You've got, I think it's something on the neighborhood of 27 or 28 street end access points to provide access of varying uh, capabilities, uh, some better than others, uh, that should be looked at as to how we can enhance those. And then we should probably look at, are there other alternatives for water access that can be uh, brought to bear within the city um, that don't, don't necessarily fall into one of the maritime zones, but, um, but could be implemented else, somewhere else in the city. So I, my concern, my major concern, and I know Mr. Uh, Nolan, who represents Annapolis City Marina shares this concern, is that the other, the latter two issues don't slow down or retard progress on affecting, um, addressing the maritime zones, 
because those are the ones that have brought this to the forefront and those zones are the ones that are the most unequal playing field. The other two are broader and I think equally important, but should be separated or segregated out from the, um, the primary focus, and I say primary focus because that's my primary focus, uh, on a le more level playing field among the existing zones. And to the extent that you do that with a steering committee and then subcommittees, or you do that with uh, a, a little bit separate, little bit different makeup in terms of membership for the three groups, uh, I leave it to uh, Ms. Fogarty and uh, planning and zoning in the council to figure that, to maybe figure that out, but I'm happy to offer input. But that was the gist of my email. You can look at my email in more detail, but that's, um, that's those are the three points that I wanted to make in my, made my email I wanna to make today. Well, let me ask a question of uh, Alderman Arnett. Um, do you feel the amendments that you're considering would encompass uh, what Mr. Lomax is describing as objectives for the task force? It could, but um, uh, I, I mean, I ex expressed at the beginning that uh, perhaps the uh, task force is overly ambitious and it is diverse enough in its mission that um, we may be trying to accomplish too many things in one place. Uh, on the other hand, I counterbalance that quickly with, I don't think we should let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So the real question, and this is why I turn to you, my two colleagues, is do we want to noodle along on this forever or do we want to start to address what are issues that are long overdue. Um, looking at the maritime zones is, was in the last two comp plans. Uh, it has been in every single uh, mayoral transition team, which Mr. Lomax has probably been on far too many of uh, for his taste. Uh, and, uh, you know, I just don't know how long this can wait. So I'm, I'm really torn between, I think we can make some fixes today that will send us on its way and it'll find its um, proper level. Um, but I also, um, I don't really want to do this until we're pretty sure it's right and has a chance for success. And I actually, I, I would like to hear from Mr. Dales, um, but I actually would like to have some opportunity to speak to our city attorney about this, who is an expert in writing legislation. He may have some ideas about the level of ambition and, and so forth. And of course, Eileen is waiting patiently. She is the contractor. Uh, uh, <laughs> Alderman, I don't, have, I don't have an expectation that we're gonna vote on this today. Okay, I don't that's think fine with me too. I, I don't think it is ready. So that's why I'm asking if you can include what Mr. Lomax is describing as part of your amendment to this legislation I, that you'll put I can. Back. I can. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. We're going to go next to um, Ms. Uh, Fogarty, um, and I'm looking at my watch, but we're good. Um, thank you very much, Chairwoman. Uh, I wanted to just provide a little clarity for everyone. You all have put a lot of work into an ambitious project. What we, and I say we, the planning department, um, the city manager, and the mayor, what we are uh, tackling first is the are the maritime zoning districts. And that really answers, I think, um, Terry Lomax's question. Now, un so that will be the first phase. And I would think of them in phases. Phase one are the maritime zoning districts. Um, under the maritime zoning districts, we will have um, a few working teams. They have not all been uh, defined yet, but we know we will have a working team for what we call community benefits or public access, because that will help define what are the types of um, amenities that are important to the community in terms of offering flexibility to the property owners. Um, there'll also be a working team on the industry needs 
and the industry needs as they relate to the waterfront. So uh, I guess two point, three points. One, maritime zoning um, will be going first. Secondly, um, our goal, all of our goals is to reach a consensus. When you have uh, land uses uh, where you don't have consensus, they don't last over time. You need to have everyone bought into them. And maybe- Aha, uh -huh. uh -huh. some music. Sorry. Maybe, maybe this will get reevaluated in five years or eight years, but we want something that we reach a consensus with the community, the property owners, and the, and when I say the community, the community at large, the property owners, and the industry and itself. So reaching consensus is the objective. The maritime zones will be the first phase of this larger, um, of this larger concept that Alderman Arnett has laid out. And then within that, we will be looking at the industry needs. We will be looking at uh, public access. And I would say the, uh, I took along with the, um, the city manager, the planning director, um, and also talked with the mayor. I took what was initially your composition and I just tried to balance it. If there is a desire for more residents, you could add that one of two ways. You could actually add them to the task force composition, which now is at 20, or you could add them to the working teams. If you think about the city dock, and we, we do not want to get to be that size, but the city dock had a task force of, I think, 22 or 24 people. We had working teams of 92. Now, we don't want to get to 92, but the point is you all, as the council members and us working uh, with this task force, we need some flexibility if we, uh, we need to bring on people who are experts, who have a commitment to the city for these various working groups. So you've got opportunity here to either, uh, I would say to be let to not be much more prescriptive than what you have already done. And then if you want to add additional people uh, let's say there are four uh, business owners, maybe three business owners weren't included. They could join as part of a working team as well as uh, residents. So you have those options. You'll have working teams. Um, you've got a basic structure and um, our first task will be the zoning. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alderman Savage, did I miss your hand on um, doing Mr. Lomax's um, presentation? Did um, you have a question for him? Yeah, but it's okay. Um, I'll ask my questions after we hear from everybody. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Fogarty. Uh, Mr. Dales, wake up. <laughs> oh, oh, believe me, he's God. awake. Yeah, um, <laughs> I gotta say, thank you very much, uh, Alderman Finlayson. Um, I gotta say that I'm pretty confused by Ms. Fogarty's testimony just a minute ago, because it sounded like the, there's a list of 20 potential members, and I've only seen the initial introduced bill of uh, that was at 12, and then there was a talk about sort of the, the plan of attack for this task force that doesn't exist yet. So I'm, I think it would help for me to understand what actions have been taken other than those that are, have been made public before I provide any kind of meaningful testimony. In fact, what Ms. Fogarty described as a plan of attack makes good sense to me. Uh, but you know, if, I, if there's information that's not been made public about the plans for this task force and who's gonna be on it, you know, I, I did, I'm not, I'm, my comments were planned before I had heard any of what was just said. Well, I, um, Alderman Arnett, I, I know what was revealed earlier was the fact that the fiscal note indicated that funding for the contractor for or the consultant was in the 21 budget. So obviously there was plans for this task force. Uh, how that came about, I'm not sure. All well, the main, money, I mean, uh, Ms. Fogarty is the person that planning and zoning 
as TAP to help honcho this. And Dr. Nash is on, she can speak to that. I don't have, I, I'm delighted, but uh, that's coming out of her budget. Um, I, I'm a little more troubled by uh, what Phil just said about um, um, Eileen's comments. Uh, Eileen is the person on the staff level and from the administration that is going to sh shepherd this through. Uh, this is a committee that uh, a task force that the rules committee is definitely looking to, to provide us legislative help, but it also has to work for the administration. So um, uh, I, you know, I, I'll leave it to Eileen and Phil to figure out what the miss the the concern is, but I see Dr. Nash. Maybe she can jump in and bail us out. Dr. Right. Nash. Um, well, I would just say we weren't exactly planning to do this. I knew it was possible that we might need to, and um, but I'm having it come out of our comprehensive plan money because I see this as very much a comprehensive, long-range planning issue, at least the zoning portion of the task force, which is what I would have Eileen focus on. I'm not sure of our expertise as far as the other aspects of the task force. I can pull in economic development, but um, you know, I think those are kind of broader and more complicated issues. I don't think we need to worry about having the perfect composition for the task force. I think we need to either stick with what we have or you know maybe make a few tweaks but generally i think it's important just to get started and as eileen is saying we can have other people um you know participate and just because you're not on the task force we're, we're not going to not allow someone to participate and we might need to draw on different expertise depending on what particularly what particular topic we are, have on the table at the moment. So um, I, I don't know, I, I am worried that if we spend too much time figuring out the perfect composition of the task force, um, we're not gonna ever get to looking at the actual zoning uh, that we need to, to work, um, hash out, which isn't going to be an e easy task either. So, um... it Mr. Dales. Alderman Liz, thank you. I, uh, what I plan to say does address some of those issues. I think I was more um, confused by the, the notion that there's already a plan and agenda for the task force before it exists. And I just was wondering if there had been anything discussed to that, like you know, plans for how, how the task force is going to work, which would be uh, helpful to, to making comments about these issues of composition and goals of the task force. But I think probably better for me just to provide comments say why I'm here and um, what my thoughts are on the whole mm -hmm. composition. So um, I'm here as a member and advisor to a group that we're calling AMPS, which is Annapolis Maritime Progress and Sustainability. It's right now um, the property owners um, of over 20 acres of maritime property, which is obviously a significant amount. And it's from all four zoning districts. And we've got four of the city's better known marinas from uh, Birch Haven's Yacht Yard to Port Annapolis, Horn Point, um, South Annapolis Yacht Center, uh, some well-known businesses in Allsop Marine, um, Pier 4, uh, and, and quite a few others. There's eight total uh, members now. Um, so the reason the group was formed was Ross's, uh, or Alderman Arnett's uh, ordinance to change uh, some of the rules at the WMM zone property for Annapolis City Marina. The group of property owners in AMPS saw that happening and we're supportive of the change, but we're very, very concerned that there would be one last change and that the door would be shut and they would be left out of uh, well-needed changes, which were changes which are uh, needed from what uh, uh, Chair Lomax described as this imbalance between the WMI, WME, and then the WMM, which has existed you know, for over 30 years. So um, those members have been kind of following along with the, the proposal that there be a task force to um, uh, implement the goals listed in the resolution. And the, the, the resolution lists four goals, um, and they're all for good, but one of them stands out very clearly as one that has, um, you know, there's the other recommendations besides the, uh, the, the primary goal, which is to, to take a look at and propose changes to 
the zoning ordinance, including new uses that would be proposed. Um, all, all the other uses are sort of to make uh, findings, to uh, to review the status of access, to promote um, uh, certain activities and um, market the maritime uh, uh, community of the city. Those are all very important, but if you're, if one of the goals is to make actual changes to the city code, and those changes are going to affect the property zoned by maritime property owners, it would seem to our group that um, those owners are going to be most directly affected, as Chairman Lomax also said, um, uh, it'll uh, directly affect their livelihood. And so I think the way I'll make these comments is, you know, with regard to the ordinance as it was, or the resolution as it was proposed, you know, what our thoughts were about the goals and the composition. And then second, I'll make a, a quick comment about um, Ross's initial thought and what's, what's been uh, discussed by others too, and, and that there be potentially subcommittees with other members that can be involved. Um, as the ordinance was written, it, it, there's no mention of the subcommittees. Um, and so, you know, with what I've said as to the owners being most um, directly affected, we think that the recommendation there will be two maritime property owners out of 12 total members is disproportionate representation for maritime property owners, um, or I should say disproportionately um, underrepresented. And uh, with that in mind, we had understood there would be an amendment to increase the proportion of maritime property owners on uh, the task force. And again, there was no mention of or explicit uh, uh, direction for this task force to create subcommittees with other memberships, you know, focus on different goals. Um, now, I think besides there being, um, you know, if you're going to change the zoning of people's property, it is, I'd say, more than customary expected that you'd seek their input. There's also a good reason to seek the input of these maritime property owners. For those last 30 years, especially in the WME and WMI that have had this disadvantage, the people who've owned those properties have the best um, knowledge and experience of the challenges created by the, um, the limitations of the zoning ordinance. So they know why the maritime uh, community and maritime ministries are suffering and why the zoning isn't allowing for um, a, a, an environment for a healthy maritime economy in, in, in the modern, in the current sense of the, what maritime industry is now. Um, I think you, you're going to need that input for this to work well. And that, that applies to the proposed changes too, to know what from the maritime owners the effects of these changes would be to know that they, this would help or this would, for one reason or another, be feasible or not feasible is is critical. And if the task force is just those 12, respectfully, Dr. Nash, I think that uh, although others could participate, it, it's really um, not comforting enough to know that we would be you know, allowed to provide our comments as we are already. It's to have a vote in what presumably will be a, a, a task force that makes decisions by vote at some point. Um, I think is is fair to ask and would lead to a more successful um, outcome from the task force. So those are my thoughts as, as the resolution is written, is that there should be more property owners from each of the zones, and particularly WMI and WME, so that you're getting you know full representation from them, as opposed to um, the, the uh, what I think is somewhat redundant, having both maritime tenants and maritime business owners, which you know, are most of the time the same, although I guess it is true that there are businesses like Fawcett that are not maritime tenants, but should absolutely have a place on a task force or a group to make the advisory comments on this. Um, I think, again, just I think the point is that there's not enough maritime owners. However, I think that, um, you know, my thoughts for this committee today would be that you could recommend in favor of the goals that, the, that are in the resolution and say that, the, that if, the committee was inclined to do it today that that changes to the composition if they address the um, concerns that come up in your discussion today uh, if the changes to the composition address those concerns then the committee could be um, in favor of the resolution as it may be amended to the council now with the thought that there could be subcommittees if that's the case that might be the smartest thing to do given the broad range of goals um, you know with, from access to promoting maritime businesses and marketing the maritime community to the actual review of the zoning ordinance. Um, I think overall, the task force is looking to improve the health of our maritime community and the most direct action it's gonna take is recommendation on the zoning ordinances. 
if we're going to have subcommittees, which again, I think may be very smart, I think that that should be included in the amendment to say there will be a subcommittee for each goal and that there would be X number of members of each subcommittee that could be appointed in um, a similar way to the, the members of the task force. So those are my thoughts um, and I'm happy to, to answer any questions. I, I can say that, that three or four members of our task force have already um, said that directly that they would volunteer their time. Uh, and Rod Jabin, uh, Seth Leonard, who is her important point, Cole Alsop of Alsop Marine, um, and I've got uh, requests into others to confirm that they'd also be willing to spend their time on the task force or subcommittees if asked. So then thanks very much and I'll, I'll stick around. Um, thank you, Mr. Dales. Um, I just wanted to point out one thing to you. You mentioned subcommittees several times and there is a notation, not a notation, but an item that says they may be uh, created as needed. And I think we heard Ms. Fogarty mention her strategy for creating subcommittees. So I think that is covered in the legislation. Um, I sure do have an amendment specific to that. I have three amendments, but... You're, you're on my... Uh, you're... I, have, I have three amendments and one of them speaks to that, to the subcommittees. Okay. okay. Um, and Ms. Van Lysen, I'm sorry, this is Jim Nolan. I, I saw I, you, Mr. Nolan. I was going to call on you next. Well, thank you. I just want to say hello, and I apologize for getting in. Fortunately, I was able to get a hold of Miss Green, and she had to do something to allow me in, so here I am. Well, good. Um, I'll call on you next. Um, I you. had see uh, Alderman Savage had his hand up, but sure. I was going to say, Alderman Arnett, you've heard from um, a group that may be a good source um, when the mayor or whomever is going to be selecting this committee uh, to consider. Oh, yeah, definitely. I don't think there's a shortage of good people. Mm -hmm. Alderman Savage, did you have your hand up again or are you going to wait till everyone spoke? I'll wait till after uh, Mr. Nolan speaks. Okay. Uh, welcome, Mr. Nolan. And no Thank problem. You. We all have issues with getting on sometimes. So it's all good. <laughs> Thank you. This is Zoom society in which we live. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, thank you. Uh, I believe that several of you know that uh, I and my law firm represent Annapolis City Marina. And this is how we became involved in this particular matter. And we started this uh, odyssey, as I refer to it, uh, probably close to a year and a half ago. Uh, we have met with uh, Alderman Arnett a number of times, and uh, he's been extremely helpful. And we actually came up with uh, an ordinance that uh, Ross introduced uh, 01520 some, uh, some time ago. And we thought that this was a very realistic way of dealing with this uh, issue of our clients, specific clients problem, and that is it has an existing property with approximately 75,000 square feet of professional office space. And in the WMM, of course, professional office space is permitted, subject to standards. And the practical problem is that for 20 plus years, the federal government has been leasing approximately 35,000 square feet of that space and has been considered a maritime user. Well, the federal government, uh, we think driven predominantly by the current administration who wanted to show favor to other people who supported the current administration, announced that it was going to be moving its federal offices out of Annapolis City Marina this past February. Um, there was really nothing to be done about it because quite frankly, it was a political maneuver in our opinion uh, and, and our client is getting uh, hammered as a result of that. The only thing that prevented the move this past February was COVID and the lease does expire uh, this coming February, 2021, and the federal government has advised uh, without question that it is moving. So all of a sudden, Annapolis City Marina is going to be stuck with about 35,000 square feet of uh, unoccupied office space 
that must be filled under the current law by maritime uh, professional office users. Uh, we have done extensive research on the issue and have all the statistics, which we're happy to share at any time with anyone, city council, the task force, et cetera, on the fact that there simply are uh, no significant number of maritime users out there uh, right now. And it's gonna be virtually impossible to fill this existing space uh, with maritime office users uh, to replace the federal government. I know that this is a problem that is shared by other businesses across the maritime districts. And we have heard from the businesses and quite frankly, uh, we're not in opposition to having other districts being allowed to have professional office use. The key thing for us though, is we're very serious that maritime, hard maritime needs to be preserved. Marinas, uh, boat facilities, fuel docks, uh, et cetera. All the things that are currently uh, shown uh, in the WMM uh, as the, um, um, the things that allow, the triggers that allow professional office uh, uh, users, quite frankly, uh, to, an ex to some extent. So we're very much on board with what this task force is trying to do. We were hoping to have our client's problem resolved. And quite frankly, it's a problem that exists across the WMM. I happen to represent two other uh, locations within the WMM that have the same exact problem. And they're teetering on uh, the verge of losing current maritime tenants because of the economy and uh, being stuck in the same position we are. Uh, less numbers, but the same exact problem. So we have an acute economic problem. Uh, we're not looking to build more buildings. We're not going to increase traffic. Uh, we want to preserve our current uh, marina. We want to preserve our current fuel dock which quite frankly has been probably averaging over 300 users per weekend, uh, people who need fuel because the only other fuel dock uh, on, the, on Spa Creek is across at the Yacht Basin Company. And the problem there is most average boaters uh, who come to Annapolis need a place to fuel up, but they can't sit there and wait for five, six hours well, Steve Bouchotti and the others with the massive yachts fuel up their vessels. Um, we want to preserve the maritime uh, character of the property. The real question is, does it really matter who's sitting inside the buildings that already exist? And uh, Alderman Arnett is very sensitive to this. I've talked to uh, Terry Lomax. Uh, he's very sensitive to this. I know as Terry says, we just need to, there to be an equal playing field across the maritime districts. But of course, the one of the big issues, which I know the task force will have to take a look at, is well, what if any triggers uh, are available uh, to allow uh, uh, non-maritime uh, professional office users? Uh, we have triggers, some don't. That's a very sensitive issue, which I think needs to be discussed. But the bottom line is that uh, we understand that the task force, quite frankly, is the way to resolve this. We urge uh, this committee, rules committee, to go ahead and get this done and so we can get this task force going, because time is of the essence. Um, we took a look at the proposal that Island and Fogarty made about the composition. We're fine with that. And we think there are pr plenty of good people uh, around to fill these slots who will be sensitive to everyone's needs. But really the key thing for us is time is of the essence. And the resolution that uh, Ross uh, introduced, we'd love to see it go forward with a couple of tweaks perhaps as to the composition uh, of the uh, members. Uh, I do note, as uh, Ross pointed out, that it does say right now in section 8.5 uh, uh, that the task force may establish subcommittees as needed. I think we're gonna leave it up to the subcommittee and, uh, and I understand uh, thankfully that Arlene Fogarty will, 
more or less run the task force, which I think is great. She's done a great job, and she certainly knows the history here. Um, and I think she set, is sensitive to everybody's uh, interests and needs, including the public's. But we believe the way this is thing, this thing is set up, that uh, uh, 9B uh, talks about uh, moving ahead uh, on this uh, zoning issue. We take a look at uh, 10A, which talks about evaluation or recommendations on the existing waterfront uh, maritime zoning district. Let's get that into play. It talks about the task force being able to make short and long-term recommendations uh, where immediate legislative changes are needed. And we think it's pretty obvious that there are some immediate changes that are needed. And even on uh, section 11 uh, for deliverable A, it talks about taking up the issue of maritime zoning districts effectiveness and use as the first item of business. Um, we strongly encourage this committee to move ahead and please get this done. We don't need any more delay. We've been at this for over a year and a half, but um, we have the ability right now, we think to have this move ahead and God knows we need it as do other, uh, other businesses that are out there. Uh, it would be catastrophic to continue to delay this thing and it's, it's gonna hurt not only the businesses, but quite frankly, the citizens, because our client is in a position that if it doesn't get some relief, it's gonna have to shut down its fuel dock. Uh, no question about it, because we're gonna have to, quite frankly, uh, replace fuel tanks at, at the tune of about a million, uh, a million two uh, in the near future if we keep the, the docks open. We can't afford to do that unless we get some help on the professional office uh, uh, ability to rent side. So again, thank you very much for letting me uh, speak. Um, we would urge this committee to move this thing ahead and, and get it done and move the task force to move ahead quickly. And we'll be happy to provide statistical information and other business information, whatever anyone needs upon request. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Nolan. Um, you um, missed Alderman Arnett's opening remarks when he shared <laughs> a litany of things that he thought were needed for this legislation. So uh, we'll see how fast we can get there. But we thank you very much. to see this get bogged down uh, in bureaucracy, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Thank you. Alderman Savage, you've been patient. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I tend to find myself agreeing with uh, Dr. Nash's remarks. Um, you know, in terms, of, I don't think we should necessarily be spinning our wheels on this and kind of echoing some of the remarks from Mr. Nolan. Um, you know, there seem to be a lot of questions about the composition, but really, I don't think that's that's the, the most crucial uh, component to this. Uh, I think we need to get started and kind of treat this like part of the comprehensive plan um, and uh, get this finished in time so we can get the things rolled into that plan. But I also, um, you know, in terms of the, the composition again, I think one way perhaps to address this and avoid having to just fight over the uh, public comments, I mean the uh, fight over the composition, is just simply perhaps we could insert something uh, and of course, Alderman Arnett, this is, this is your legislation. I'm curious what you think about this, but if we could just maybe insert something in this legislation saying that uh, you know, we require that the, the task force um, shall be open to the public and that the task force shall allow for public comments via oral or written testimony. That'll at least allow people who aren't on the, like you said yourself, there are a lot of qualified people to be on this and maybe we just need to open it up and say, hey, you can submit comments, but when it comes down to, we just need to, we need to I think, come up with a, a solid core group of folks who are going to be um, the decision makers. And I do like what Ms. Fogarty has laid out in terms of the task force. I think that's a, a good move, and I think that helps uh, respond to some of Mr. Lomax's you know, comments. Um, so, and in terms of, I think, so I do have a question for Mr. Lomax. Um, and um, you know, how do you see for the, are you still there? I'm here. Find them, mm -hmm. there they are. Um, 
So in terms, I'd like to know, hear your thoughts in terms of the involvement of the Maritime Advisory Board. Uh, are you are you happy with the um, role that's laid out for the Maritime Advisory Board in this task force, or do you think you uh, would like more I, of a role in it, or less? No, I, or? Think, I think the um, I think there's two two components to this. I assume that any future legislation would come back to the Maritime Advisory Board yes. uh, for input. So I'm not as concerned that the current task force be. Um, overburdened with, with members from the Maritime Advisory Board, some of whom are almost all of whom fall into one of the categories that Ms. Fogarty has proposed. Uh, I think it's either I or someone, uh, and perhaps myself, but or someone from the from the board, uh, it, it will be useful to be on the uh, on the task force group as it's proposed. But I don't think we need any more representation than that. I will say I will add that. Um, I listened to Ms. Fogarty's uh, comments and also some of Alderman Arnett's follow-up comments. And I, I, I agree that we should not uh, stand on ceremony trying to get the total, the exact composition, perhaps all that precise that we can certainly use subcommittees. The, fo the focus of my remarks was all more that different components of this need to be taken in sequence, as Mr. Nolan pointed out, the, the zoning first, uh, but also that different, there should be, and it could be done with subcommittees, there should be primary focus of input from a sort of, sort of different constituents. And I use that not in the voting perspective, but just in the membership of the makeup of the subcommittee perspective, um, that there's, there's going to be different makeup in each of the three or four tasks that are set there. But uh, again, I do think timing is important that this move forward uh, sooner rather than later. I think you may I ask. Yes, I'm sorry. May I ask uh, Ms. Fogarty, actually, um, when you put together the City Doc Master Plan Committee, um, you had your core committee and then you had 92 other people. <laughs> How did you? solicit that 92 other people um because i'm i'm hearing that you know maybe we have the core group but the interest is in making sure that others know that they can have a, vo a voice in a different capacity uh, that's a very good question um older woman finlayson so initially what happened is that there were the 22 or 24 people and then a variety of uh, people, council people, uh, the mayor, historic Annapolis, many people in the community um, brought additional names forward. And it was at that point that um, I structured working teams and then said, to, so that we could have, um, if we were going to bring more people in, we would have it in um, categories that were really uh, useful to the uh, the mission. So there was a working team, for example, on parking and access. So then we identified people who were parking experts. Uh, there was a working team for programming. And um, that's when we uh, got people like Chris Ailey, and Reverend Allen, we went out to bring in people for specific uh, working teams, their expertise as well as their interest. And we we certainly don't want to go to 92. Um, it was a huge effort, but it would be in that capacity if we have a working team on public access, that would be an opportunity to bring in people from the community that's not just the immediate residents. That would be an opportunity to bring in residents citywide. That was how it was done. So is that your strategy for this committee? Is that, because that sounded like that's what you were, you were talking about when you spoke previously. You know, in a, in a perfect world, we would sit down and figure all this out day one. It never, ever, ever works like that. People get ideas, and other people are excited. And what the committee needs to have or the task force 
is enough flexibility. I think just as uh, Phil was saying, he wants to make sure that owners have input. Um, you want to make sure that there's a waterfront that's not gated off to the rest of the city. So structuring it for, I would say, opportunity and flexibility, where you've got the basic committee, um, and then we, we can create, as we hear of some of the other interests, we can create the uh, working groups and then put people on the working groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Alderman Arnett and then Mr. Dales. So I would like to suggest uh, three amendments and I'll give you the broad brush strokes of that. And then possibly a fourth one that I hope Rob will suggest and I have really lost train of, of the thing you mentioned that you'd want the task force to be sure to do. But the three amendments are um, focused on page three, number one, which I will offer uh, a change to the composition of the task force and um, some rules about the task force purview over subcommittees. I will specifically call for three subcommittees, one for the zoning legislation, one for the, health, the uh, maritime industry health, and one for the access to uh, and safety on waters and also give the task force to establish other subcommittees as needed. And then the, the last one is to strike in its entirety section nine and jump right to the task force deliverables, which give you the three subcommittees. They're the guts of the three subcommittees. So it's the, evalu the evaluation of the code it's the evaluation of the health of the industry and it's evaluation of safety, access and safety. Um, I, I think that um, number nine, I find it confusing to read it myself. And I think that it gets in the way of just going from task force composition to the subcommittees to the deliverables. So I can go into more detail on that if you want to hear that now, or I can come back with them whenever you're ready for the specific amendments. Well, um, I mean, these are your amendments. What was the first one? Was that just zoning? No, the first one is the, in number one on page three, line one, number one, is to substitute in the task force uh, composition uh, like the language that Eileen sent us earlier today. Um, I, I don't have that in front of me. So that's all right. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what it says. It calls for four maritime property owners, four maritime business owners, four maritime industry tenants, four residents, and then I'm calling for the Maritime Advisory Board, the Maritime Trade Association representative, a representative for the environment and a representative for the Maritime Museum. And then I add these members will serve as a steering committee for the task force and uh, over the subcommittees. Okay, okay, let me ask before you go on. So you're substituting what you just read for lines Five through, 16. five through 16. Correct. So you're removing lines five through 16 and substituting it with your new list of right. the members. Could you, could you state that again? Yeah. Um, so the composition it says here shall be comprised of, and I guess that gets struck 20 members as follows. <laughs> Four maritime property owners. Uh, and these are all people that will be selected by the mayor with council from probably the great hordes, but certainly with the waterside alderman. Four maritime property owners, four maritime business owners, four maritime industry tenants, four residents, and then four more people who will be the Maritime Advisory Board, the Maritime Trades Association, the uh, someone from the environment, and someone from the Maritime Museum. And then the, after the 
stating the composition. It will go on to say these members will serve as a steering committee for the task force uh, of the all of all subcommittees. Okay, uh, Mr. Dales, does that speak to your concern about your the group that you represent? Yes, uh, Alderman Lanson, it does speak to the concerns. Um, I think uh, it, it's, it's, it addresses in particular the concern about accountability or some sort of assurance that there would be a, a subcommittee for those different tasks. I think Alderman Arnett's idea there is um, very well aimed, but I just, I would add that um, a lot of the opinions expressed in the committee meeting today are that this underrepresented group, and in fact, there are a couple of underrepresented groups in the property owners and those in wards that are not on the water um, should be content or comforted that they will have a voice through the channels that are available to all people in the public. But respectfully, as you know, part of this group that feels itself um, most directly impacted and underrepresented, we just don't share that opinion. Um, I think that you know, the increase to from two to four for property owners that Ross has just outlined in his proposed amendment and the um, the specific language to create the subcommittees leaves us with the hope that the subcommittees at least would be um, inclusive of these property owners that um, what Ms. Bogarty's point was, I need to buy in to this, you know, the proposed recommendation, the ultimate action of the council to rezone their properties. So um, I think in part, yes, Alderman Arnett's amendments are uh, addressed the concerns that we would have, but I just want to you know, put a point on that view that even though others may see the need to move forward quickly and expeditiously, which we absolutely agree, having lost tenants in just the same way that um, Annapolis City Marina is about to, um, we do feel it's important that we have uh, a direct voice on the task force or through its subcommittee. So that said, um, I think I've expressed my, said my piece. And I think my second amendment that has to do with the subcommittees will further that thought, but I see Alderman Savage has his. Uh, but I'm calling on Mr. Lomax next. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman, Chairperson. Uh, Alderman Arnett, what is not clear, and I'm not, frankly, I have to admit, I'm not looking at the legislation. I thought that in the original legislation, the some of the composition was specific that they had to be from particular zones. Is your intention to remove that or is this just changing the numbers but keeping that language as to representation from specific zones intact? That's, the, that's a very interesting question and it's one of, of finesse a little bit because quite frankly, it seems to me that there are two uh, and a half maritime zones that are really important here. I think the WMI, the WME, and the WMM. I, the WMC is still a maritime zone, but it's really not very much in play anymore because it's been greatly diminished. But in my mind's eye, yes, I certainly want to see uh, each of the four maritime zones represented because they're going to be talking about the maritime zoning legislation which covers all four zone. But I'm, you know, I'm, I'm trying to find a balance between making this so uh, proscribed that we stifle it before it ever gets off the board. So um, I'm saying four owners, I think my mind's eye, they would be owners in four zones. I think businesses are going to be in four, potentially in the four zones, but could also be outside of any maritime zone tenants as it's being used here, and I think that's not overly defined, tends to be people who are tenants in the existing maritime zones. So Andy Fegley is a tenant, Patrick Shaughnessy is a tenant, and they're tenants in the maritime zones. I don't, I don't have a concept of a tenant in a non-maritime um, zone that would have meaning for this analysis. Uh, there are, there's a specific goal to include non-maritime uses in the proposed new uses to be considered. I, I would think having all maritime tenants and maritime businesses or a disproportionate number of them would leave us without a lot of recommendations for that particular goal. But, but actually, my, my question was, 
it, it goes to the fact that once this is out of the council, it is then up to the mayor to appoint. And I would, I think Mr. Dales would share with me that we would be, uh, it would not be um, appropriate that suddenly, you know, four maritime businesses and four maritime tenants, none of which were in any of the zones, uh, were appointed and maybe four maritime property owners by nature of the definition of a maritime property owner would probably have to come from one of the four zones. But that, and that's just, I just opt that as a concern as we go forward about the makeup. I, I don't wanna overly um, uh, complicate this, but when you read the amendment, I wasn't clear that uh, we had that there was a specific allocation for zones or requirement to come from a zone. Well, I mean, that certainly can be a refinement. I can tell you that the mayor has been very engaged in this. And also my feeling for whatever that's worth to you, the mayor has been looking to me uh, a lot to take the lead on refining this. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, we could turn this into volumes, um, subsetting this and subsetting it. To some extent, ultimately, uh, the mayor will have the power to name the members on this committee and that's how this is constructed. And really that's how most things in the city are constructed. And I'm not sure I wanna go about changing that at all at this point. Uh, Alderman Savage and then Ms. Fogarty. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just going down a list of amendments, Alderman Arnett, I do, I like the uh, third amendment striking section nine. Uh, just reading through that, I. I I do think some of it, I think, wasn't very clear. Um, and I think Section 10, certainly it goes through enough of the deliverables. Um, and as far as the Second Amendment, for the subcommittees, I think that's that's good as well. But in terms of the First Amendment, I'm sorry to say this, but <laughs> I think I, I prefer the original uh, composition just because I... Uh, I just feel like the, I tend to like smaller task force with smaller membership. Uh, I think they're more efficient. And I think uh, you know, the amendment I'll, I'd, I'd propose would be again, simply adding the uh, public comment, requiring a public comment component to hear from the other voices. But I think we need to have the smaller, a smaller number. And, and the numbers you're proposing you know, it's just, it's, it would make a very industry business heavy. And I know they're, they're just compared to the other residents. And I do kind of share Mr. Lomax's concerns about uh, making sure we have reps from each of the, the different zone, zoning districts because they are uh, unique. I think they were created for specific purposes. And um, so in that sense, I'm not at this point inclined to support that amendment, but, um, yeah, um, I, I understand that. I, I do think that um, we are. Um, we can go down to line thirty-one and um, number five, and where I say there is, the task force will establish subcommittees for each of the three deliverables: uh, zoning evaluation, maritime health, and access and safety. And then it goes on to say that the task force can establish other committees as necessary. That leaves open the membership of all of those subcommittees. And I would assume that the subcommittee that's looking at the maritime zoning will be heavily populated by the people who are in the maritime zones, which are the owners, the businesses, and the tenants. Um, but well, I will hasten to point out from, from my constituents that residents point out that they live next to these maritime zones and are impacted by these maritime zones. So they want some representation uh, to have a say in it. So, uh, but that's in the current legislation that is taken care of from one resident from each of the different uh, zoning district. So, um, I mean, I, I kind of agree with you, Rob. I uh, Having a gigantic steering committee 
just seems to me like a recipe to stymie this just in getting a quorum, but also just having a working relationship. But I say that in front of Eileen, who <laughs> has worked with a gigantic <laughs> group of people on something that's even more contentious than this. So it clearly can be done. Uh, it's just not my inclination. Ms. Fogarty. Uh, thank you very much. Um, in response to uh, Alderman Savage's comment, so all I did, Rob, was I took the comments from the mayor, from Councilman Arnett, from you had uh, letters from uh, Phil Dales, from um, the Maritime Advisory Board, from Marine Trades. And I looked at what everybody, and then you had interest from um, older woman Finlayson in terms of having other representatives. And I looked at what everybody had requested. And it seemed to me that, and I'll, I'll get to the property owners first, that two property owners was not going to work in the sense that the property owners are going to want to have their voices heard at least from each of the districts. So when we increased the property, the number of property owners, we also, and businesses are uh, different than property owners, um, we also increased each one of the others to keep a balance. The residents and the public interest groups were seen as a balance together because typically um, the residents and public interest groups tend to have similar, um, similar issues of wanting public access to the water, um, a healthy or um, quality of water. So that was how we, we got to where we are. Now, with that said, um, I recommended to the mayor and to uh, Ross that we cap it at 20. Well, what I've seen in most uh, task forces is you typically have at least a quarter of the people at any given meeting don't come for whatever reason, not consistently, but they have conflicts. So if you had 20 uh, people, you would at least have 15 uh, represented uh, should have 15 represented at all the meetings. And I think 20 is a workable size. I would agree with you that it, it shouldn't be any larger, but that's how uh, we got there was taking the, the comments that seemed very legitimate from the various people that um, approached rules commission, rules committee, and then hammering it out to be um, balanced. And may I just jump in quick on that? Yes, please. Uh, yes. Yeah, thank, thank you for the explanation. And that does help. Um, I mean, but I'm still, I'm still kind of inclined to think, I, mean, I, I think I understand people want to get on the committee. They feel like that's probably, you know, the best way they can have a, a voice and, and kind of have influence over the outcome. But I, I think we really need to just keep in mind that these are, this is going to be a public task force. It's going to be open to everybody, the public. We can even put it in here that the public can attend, the public can comment. Um, and so I think we just need to make it clear that they don't have to be on this board, this task force to have their voices heard. Just like when we make our decisions on this committee, it's only three of us, but we, we try to hear from as many people as we can from the public. But ultimately, it's just the three of us who are making the decision. And I think uh, and, I mean, all that said, I respect what you're saying as, as you be the, the staff person um, uh, you know, facilitating this, but I, I just I just think having a smaller group would make it hopefully easier on you um, and also uh, give us some better deliverables um, and, and perhaps avoid some of the um, back and forth um, debate that we're having on the composition. Um, let me ask Alderman Arnett, um, dealing with the zoning districts, would it help uh, after each of the uh, items 
for example, property owners, businesses, tenants, residents, that you put in parentheses those who live in or near and list the three zones or the four zones? Mm -hmm. Taking to Har uh, Rob's comments, and because I want his vote, um, I've looked at number one. Um, I think that you can go line five through 10 and it's fine. Um, line 11, I've struck and just said, maritime property owner from each of the WME, WMM, WMC, and WMI. Same thing on line 13, business owner, uh, owner from each of the WMM, WMM, and then line 15, business tenants from each of the WME, WMI. I don't think there are business tenants in the WMC, but we can sure. allow for that, but that makes a committee of 18. Really, uh, mm. Ms. Fogarty? Um, yes, I would, uh, again, having to work with this, I would make it clear that they should all be from the maritime districts or the maritime zones, but I would recommend you not specify each zone. For example, you may have two property owners from WMI while you don't have a property owner from WMC. I'm just saying that you, I think you should use um, Alderwoman Finlayson's language that these people, these members all come from the districts that we're talking about, but I don't think you want to specify how many from each because you know, if you look at it, the WMI is a huge amount of land whereas the WMC is a, is a much more confined space as two extreme examples. So I would say use the districts, but not get into saying one from this and one from that, so that there's a, a little bit of flexibility. A little faith in our mayor there too. Yes. Mr. Lomax? I, I would certainly agree with Eileen, Ms. Fogarty's, um, uh, comment, uh, my goal wasn't necessarily to specify one one for one for one for one, but to make sure that representatives were from the, the zones generally. So I, I think that's her, her observation is well taken. Alderman Arnett, are you good with that? I think so. Um, could you say it one more time, please, Eileen? Because I'm I'm getting calls from Heidi Hollick about going into the <laughs> appeals board meeting, so I'm distracted. You guys um, just have to balance 14 <laughs> balls at one time. Um, what I would say next to um, tenants, owners, property owners, and residents is just say, and again, with the residents, you may want to add the resident at large. Um, but just say from the districts or say as uh, so that it's property owners from the districts, business owners from the districts, the maritime districts, tenants from the districts, residents from the district, and then a resident at large. So Eileen, you could fix this then by going to line 11 and instead of saying two maritime property owners, you can say one maritime property owner from each? No, you're All just, right. uh, have you gone from four to two, which I think is, is going to really be confining. I, I think you're better off with 20 because again, 20 realistically means 15 and 15 is a workable number. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to figure out. I, I'm want to have four from the owners, from the businesses and from, but uh, in terms of uh, trying to be responsive to Alderman Savage, uh, you could go to line 11 and say one maritime property owner from the WME, WMM, WMC and WMI. Certainly there are still property owners in the WMC. Uh, you can have one business owner from each of those zones, uh, there are business owners in the WMC. I wouldn't and, do that, Ross, only okay. because you've got 
when you get to the industry and the business owners, they are heavily um, situated in WMI. Uh, they're more situated there than they, the WMC is really has, um, you have the Yacht Club and you have 110, but the WMC is more maritime in, in name. So I would, <laughs> um, I think that's the way to put it. Okay. I would leave it that they should all be from the districts and then let the mayor, you know, select across the districts. So, so let me be clear. Um, we're saying for property owners from the districts without saying we want one from each district. Correct. Okay. So we say for property owners from uh, WME, WMM, WM, well, it wouldn't be WMC, right? Or WMI. Uh, and then for <laughs> business owners and for tenants, all with the same caveat that it would be from those districts. Right, but it doesn't have to be one from each. Exactly, exactly. Um, I wasn't sure where the one at large person came from. Well, that was your um, recommendation and I, and so that no. was, no, okay. Then I'll take <laughs> that out and just leave it at, um, our Alderman Arnett had told me that uh, you had that interest, so I will take that out. And just well, as for residents. I think he's talking about the fact that we were talking about the wards that are not represented at all. But if there is a steering committee and subcommittees, okay. there will be opportunities for uh, residents from all of the wards to be heard. Okay. So that clears it up for me. Okay. Okay, so Alderman. And I'm trying to move us along because we do have other legislation that we have got to get through today because it's on the agenda for Monday's meeting. So, um, so the First Amendment, Ross, do you want Alderman Arnett? You want to take these separately? Yeah, I think that's good. Okay. So your First Amendment is the makeup of the committee, and that's four, 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 and four. Am I correct? Correct. Okay. So returning to the email that uh, Eileen sent uh, earlier today, which you don't, I don't have, have in front that. of you. Right. I don't yeah, have so it. I, I wrote down what you said. So. For maritime property owners, for maritime business owners, for maritime tenants, for residents, and then the other four members would be the Maritime Advisory Board, the Maritime Trade Association, someone from representing the environment, I'm thinking the Chesapeake Alliance and the Maritime Museum. We haven't talked much about that. They are a presence on our waterfront and they are a vital organization, but that is one that I see as more discretionary. Okay, um, sorry, my phone is ringing. I can't mute my mic and, and <laughs> uh, Alderman Savage. Uh, yeah, I mean, so I, I still am just not in favor of this. I think what I'd like to, uh, instead, I do have two amendments I'd like to propose later on after we get through Older Mayor Nets, and but just to let you know what they would do. Essentially, I think it'd be more beneficial just to require that the, basically say the task force shall reach out to maritime property owners, business owners, and business tenants in each of the maritime districts, because I'd rather see them do outreach to these communities and get a variety of voices to make sure we have uh, a large number of each representatives on the, the uh, task force itself. I think that would, um, because I, again, I think what's more important to me is is, is making sure that they do hear from all these, the variety of owners and property and businesses. And again, I don't think that needs, I don't think that's, that's a necessity um, to having uh, all of them on the board task force itself. I think we can do that in another way. So, so how, would that, supporting it. how would that amend your uh, change read, Rob? Well, I have one of them would be page three, line 45, insert nine, or, or if you remove nine, it would become eight, I guess. But um, well, I, we had an amendment on the floor. It wasn't seconded, mm -hmm. but we're not going to jump ahead. Do you want this amendment seconded, Ross? Uh, I do, but... Further discussion? <laughs> uh, yeah, I do want a second, but I am 
obviously I am sensitive to Alderman Savage's concerns. So uh, if we get it seconded, we can continue the discussion. That doesn't mean we pass. Okay, I will second it. All right. So I, again, I'm trying to think of how you would um, rejigger um, this, the um, number one on page three in uh, your sense of what that would say, uh, Rob, in terms of the comp, we have to have well, some kind of composition for the task force. So yeah, what would well, that Well, I be? would just keep it as is and then just simply add a, something later on that says the task force meetings shall be open to the public and the task force shall allow for public comments via oral or written testimony. And then insert another condition where the task force shall reach out to the maritime property owners, business owners, and business tenants in each of the maritime districts so that they, we can hear from a large variety of voices, but we're not hampering ourselves by making sure everybody under the sun has representation on the task force. Uh, I think that is kind of helps meet the same intention, which is to really make sure we hear from everybody that we need to hear from. Uh, Ross, you're on mute. I guess I'd, uh, I, I can't imagine that Mr. Dales would be happy with that, but I, I, I mean, I, to me, having a smaller workable steering committee, once we establish that this is a steering committee and that there will be at least three subcommittees that will be focusing on these areas and will be populated by people from these areas and the first two subcommittees, the zoning and the uh, industry have got to be heavily focused on owners and businesses. I, I don't see how they would not be. Um, I do think that there needs to be citizen representation on the subcommittees as well, but um, I, I guess I would be interested because Mr. Dales, along with Mr. Lomax, have been helping me throughout this process and trying to think about getting this task force established. So I'd like them to be comfortable. I think, you know, if we're talking about the difference between 12 and 20, it's a large difference. If you talk about 12 and 14 by adding two more property owners to the list, it's not a huge difference in the size of a steering committee. And I do think that uh, the suggestions of Ms. Fogarty and Chairman Lomax as to uh, not specifying they come from each district would be fine and just trust the mayor to appoint you know, four property owners from somewhere in a collection of the four different maritime districts. I think that balances um, Alderman Savage's concern with not expanding the committee so that it becomes unwieldy. It's still only 14 people um, and, and also gets the buy-in that is important to have at least, you know, I think Ms. Bogarty also said it's just, it, it is important enough to have uh, one, you know, at least one property owner per district, even if they're not from each district, four, or four to, out of four districts seems reasonable, not a large increase in size. Mr. Lomax? One, one last comment, it, it was it touched on tangentially uh, a few minutes ago. I wonder about the Maritime Museum uh, as a sitting on the steering committee. Maritime Museum, the only property interest Maritime Museum has is by virtue of a lease from the city. Uh, and I think it's a relatively nominal amount on the lease to boot. Um, and while I can see them on a subcommittee or participating at a subcommittee, having them as one of the 20, uh, gang of 20, we may be starting to call it here shortly, um, does not seem to me to make a lot of sense because they don't have a vested interest um, in, um, in really certainly in the primary goal and they're maybe only tangential about the other two goals. So um, I would I would just suggest that that one be stricken that it'll at least get it down to 19. Well, no, I'm, I'm really liking where Phil is taking us and I think it satisfies Rob and it really only requires two changes uh, in number one. The first change is on line two that changes it from 12 members to 14 members. And the second change is on line 11, which changes it from two to four maritime property owners from either the WME, WMM, WMC, or WMI. And then two member business members from the one of the four zones and two tenants from one of the four zones. 
And so that's really a minimum amount of changes. It's two changes. On line two, change it from 12 to 14. And on line 11, change it from two to four maritime property owners. That gives us, and then we need to put in the language that the uh, that these members will serve as a steering committee for the subcommittees. Well, that's a different amendment, is it not? Well, would I would have it in, I would have it on line 17. I would have it after the composition. I would have a statement saying these members will serve as a steering committee for the uh, task force subcommittees. Uh, Ms. Fogarty? Yes, I'm not sure um, what's happening um, in <laughs> trying to follow. Me either. So, um, so you would have, and, and again, um, and I certainly uh, appreciate what Alderman Savage is saying, I would just say my experience has been it's very important for people to have buy-in, and there tends to be more buy-in, whether it's on a working team or a committee than when people just come to one hearing. That's just been my own experience. So we're looking now at four maritime owners, two business owners, two tenants. Um, and, and we have the flexibility that they can come from whatever different. zone. So there might be none coming from the WMC. And then for uh, what we do with this is we short circuit the tenants, Ross, and if that's okay, um, because we had uh, we wanted to get a bunch of tenants for residents. So you've got four, eight, twelve. Then you have um, maritime advisory board, marine trades, fourteen, and then you have environment, fifteen. Is that correct? Is that well, what we are? That's not where we are, but we could go there. Depends upon. Um, so, so what the way it is now? If you have the legislation in front of you, what's on the table right now are just two changes. The the one on line two, which sets out the number of members. Ross, I don't have it in front of me. If you could just read what the numbers right. are going to be. All right, uh, so, Alderman, I'm going to insist that we get this in writing because. This is extremely confusing. You know, we've changed it and I thought we had a, a consensus and now we're going back to change and amend again. How about- I thought we were about, close, we're not. <laughs> well, so let me ask you this, since we've had so many people express a desire to um, get this uh, done in time for the October 12th vote, what if we post this and do not in the rules committee we suspend the rules committee and find a time later this week which isn't very many days left or early next week where we can reconvene the rules committee with the with these all written out and that would be the only thing on the agenda well that might be fine if we can come up with three days from now um, at, which I think would probably take us to Monday. Um, you know, uh, we have other items that we have to get to on our agenda. Yep, I agree. So, um, Ms. Green, if she can come up with um, another time to meet. I will, I will. I'm not um, sure what's gonna change. And, and I have to say, I'm, I'm not clear. Uh, Ms. Fogarty is the person that we have hired to do this, who is the professional in this capacity. And then we ignore the recommendation um, that she gives us. I just, you know. The ultimate audience for this task force results is us, the council writ large and this committee specifically. And I certainly welcome and have been working with Eileen, but I think that uh, I'm looking at the end game, which the end game is, I would like to have five council members comfortable with this to pass it. And um, I'm hearing um, some serious and, and I'm taking it to heart uh, concerns from our colleague, Robert, uh, Rob Savage on the committee and I, we haven't even gotten to the other six members of the council. 
So well, I think you're very fair in saying this is jumping all over the place and it would really be helpful to see this in writing um, so that everyone can have it in front of them and digest it. I just would um, like to uh, have the hope that we could get this task force off the ground, remembering an earlier statement, let's not let the perfect be the enemy of the good and hearkening to a testimony from our guests. Well, and I was going to repeat that same quote back to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'll repeat it back to you. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, we can postpone and, and you have to decide whether you have one amendment, two amendments or three amendments. Because initially you said you had three amendments. I wrote them down because I've been writing stuff down. Yeah, I, have, uh, I still we, have three amendments. Okay. Well, then, um, Ms. Green, if you're listening, maybe you can come up with a time on Friday or um, I guess it would have to be Monday, three business days. Yes, I sent you a, um, a text message regarding it. Okay. Can't be this week. TV crew is booked. Have to be Monday. Okay, so is that your pleasure to postpone this and reschedule a meeting of the Rules Committee for Monday? I, I would be very appreciative if we can do that. Um, we may still not be comfortable then, in which case we'll have to postpone it for a month. Um, well, then we should decide if we can now um, whether we're going to be willing to accept amendments so we can move forward on this legislation. There's no point, you know, make, booking it and getting the TV crew all signed up and then we're, we have no intentions of meeting. Well, can I make a suggestion? Please. Um, I mean, I think we have agreement on two out of the three amendments and, and I think mine are pretty uh uh, simple as well, and I imagine not con non controversial. So, the only maybe we could we could still make a recommendation with those five amendments, and just perhaps just amend the uh, the membership on the floor of the entire council if we'd like. If we just need, if we want to move forward with this, make sure it gets on the agenda for Monday. That might be one way. Well, it's on the agenda for Monday already. Uh, the issue is whether it comes forward with a recommendation from the rules committee or not. Well, we can still recommend it as amended and and um, Alderman Arnett could bring forward his other amendment for the yes. membership at the time on, on Monday. Yeah, I'm still on my call. <laughs> and you're still on air. <laughs> can you decide? Oh, thank you. So, um, I mean, I can be quite happy to to say my amendment one right now is to change line two to read 14 members and line 11 to be four property owners. And that's the only change. We can add the other uh, groups, as you say, Rob, on the floor when it's being debated by the council uh, this includes the Maritime Advisory Board, so the other groups to be considered would be... Alderman, I, I have asked that we get these amendments in writing. So I'm going to suggest that we wait until Monday. Okay. Have I'm... a meeting, and we can work these out when we have them in front of us. All right. That's why you're the chair. Well, thank you. <laughs> Okay, and Rob, you will have two amendments to present on Monday also, correct? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Green, what other items do we have to get to today? We're down to 25 minutes. First, you guys. Uh, Mr. Uh, Lomax, Mr. Nolan, uh, Ms. Fogarty, thank you very much for joining us today. And um, feel free to join us on Monday. And Mr. Dales.
And, thank and Mr. Dale, I'm thank, sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do we have a time on Monday? Uh, Not yet. Ms. Green, do we have a time? Not yet. Okay. Okay. I'll, um, I'll email them. I have their emails. All right, great. Thank you, Ms. Green. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, first, you guys need to vote to postpone this one. And then, okay. Um, I move, I move we post, postpone uh, R4620 to uh, our reconvened meeting on Monday. Is there a second? I'll second it. All in favor of postponing R46 until Monday the 12th, please say uh, aye. Wait, wait, before you do that, uh, I'm sorry. You guys did have that amendment on the floor? Um, amendment one, and it was seconded. So you have to take care of that first. And withdraw it. With, with your, okay. So okay. now we have the postponement. So all in favor of postponing, please say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. <laughs> with enthusiasm. <laughs> okay, uh, Ms. Green, what other items is O27. O27, other excluded service employees. Yes, and we have um, Jody and Trisha on. Sir, so which, what, what are we on now? O2720. O27. Um, okay, um, Ms. Hopkins, uh, this is the mayor's legislation. Can you speak to um, the need for this legislation and, and what it does? It's pretty extensive, and I do have some questions about it, but. Cool, Madam Chair Harris, as we're waiting on Trisha, I think she did do this. on. She did do this last time, and uh, just for the sake of time, I think where we ended up is we were waiting on an actual He's fiscal, on right now. fiscal impact. No. Ms. Hopkins? I'm here. I'm here. Okay, you're, you're crooked. I'm crooked. <laughs> <laughs> well, my it's sideways. I to charge my darn phone at the same time. Maybe <laughs> if I held it, that would work. Hang okay. On. How about that? Great. Okay, <laughs> better than being sideways, right? <laughs> so, so what you're after is just a, an overall explanation of why this is before you? Yeah, uh, did we postpone this before? Yes, we did. Uh -huh. <laughs> and what were we seeking when we were? Well, you got don't a lot of conversation about, um, you know, we're, we are trying with this legislation to recognize where we are in uh, financially in terms of the pandemic's impact and honor the fact that years ago there was a resolution that introduced a council um, created policy around how we handle contractual employees. And so with that policy was also the expectation that eventually these positions would be converted either to civil service or to the exempt service we are trying to move out of the world of resolutions and actually codify um, there are definitionally and practically what we do with what we're, well, we're calling them employment agreements just to not confuse them with contracts. There's a lot of confusion in the city around what's an independent contract, what's a uh, contractual employee, all of that. So it's some, a little bit of language change for the most part. It's really just what everybody's known um, has been contractual employment um, for employees that work for the city that are not in a civil service job and not in an exempt service position that is covered under that section of the code in, in Article 3. And so we're, we're trying to give you a better idea of what we envision qualifies for conversion and then set out kind of a, a, an outer limit on how much time we have to get it together for such a conversion. And so we're restarting the clock. We restarted the clock effective July 1, and then we've got five years, you know, to um, for those positions that are in FY 
21 to have them ultimately be converted appropriately to either a civil service or an exempt service position. And in the course of that conversation, what I recall is that there is a fiscal note where there's no fiscal impact this year, but the conversation, because we're talking about an outlying year of a conversion occurring, I believe the question was, how can we project a fiscal impact? Can we project beyond this fiscal year what that might be? And we all recognize this is all a moving target because we don't, you know, it's all based on how many contractual employees we have, et cetera. And um, so I, I haven't prepared that fiscal note. I don't know if Jody's um, still here on the call or not. And I'm not sure where that got that um, request has landed, um, but there is a cost. Generally, the conversion cost is because we're already typically providing benefits to these employees. The, the typical cost is for those benefits that the city also sponsors, which is for the most part a nominal cost, but really the cost of the employer contribution to the pension plan. And then those individuals that become part of the merit system, the classified system, the merit system, whatever you want to call it, are, and are entitled to merit increases will in outlying years also be eligible for what we call step increases. There's Jody. So that is something that is would be projected as a cost, but again, I don't, I, I'm not sure how we would necessarily calculate all them because there's turnover, there's, you know, there, you know, there are certain positions that we were attempting to um, convert in this fiscal year until we had to really dial things back with the with the flat revenue um, experiences we had and other COVID related impacts that, that have just um, really come into play. I guess is the best way to describe that. Is that what you needed from me? You need uh, more explanation? You're muted. You're muted. Alderwoman Finlayson, we can't hear you. Sorry, my phone was ringing. Um, yes, Ms. Hopkins, um, just to kind of refresh, at least refresh my memory as to where we were, but I'm I'm good now. So it was okay. the uh, fiscal impact note. And I think Ms. Conley gave us one, but I think it's the same one she may have given us before, which says there's no fiscal note. Uh, so we, Dickinson, can you clarify? Yeah, we. I don't. I don't know that I got. I received a request for another fiscal impact note. Um, if you want us to update it to tell you what would happen if we convert somebody, uh, and I think I just heard uh, Ms. Hopkins say that uh, we would be giving them benefits if we're already giving them health benefits, dental, et cetera, then the extra cost is putting them in the pension. And that mm -hmm. is um, for a, a state pension employee right now, it's 10, I think it's 10.4. I was just trying to find it. It's in 10.4-ish uh, percent of salary. Mm -hmm. So you add that to the cost of whatever their salary is at the time when you convert them. So you're yeah. adding, right now it's 10%. It changes every year. I anticipate over the next couple of years, it's probably going to be climbing upward a bit because of the market mm -hmm. issues right now. We're going to have to increase our contribution level in the next couple of years, but that's, that's just my prediction. And uh, yeah. so you're going to be 10, 12% of salary for anybody who's converted. And if they're not getting medical, you're going to add another 20, $25,000 annually for their costs for medical and dental. But, but I just want to clarify that what, under the Affordable Care Act, if somebody's working at least 30 hours a week, we, have we offer them medical. So if they don't mm -hmm. have medical right now, it's because they waived it. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are a few other city benefits that we um, contribute to um, that are not available to individuals that are under an agreement. Um, those, those are items like the employee assistance program, um, um, 
short-term disability, those things where we have a, have a cost that isn't passed on to the employee in order to give them that benefit. So there would be a little bit of that in there. Those mm -hmm. aren't significant, but it, I mean, it just, just trying to be open about what, what might be some of those other costs. Okay, uh, Alderman Savage, I see your hand up. Yeah, <laughs> excuse me. Um, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I would say the same thing I did last time. I'm, I'm still. I, I think this legislation is just. Uh, it's. A, I don't think it's the best way forward. I think it conflates two issues. We have the one issue, which are the the requirement, the changes. I think from the, the state regarding the the pension plans that we have to that we have to make, or that, at least that's my understanding based on what you said last time. Yeah. Then there are the changes to the contract employees and. And I think everybody could agree on the pension plans, but I'm really uncomfortable with the contract employee shift, at least with everything going on with with the um, the pandemic, and we don't know what the economic fallout's going to be. This ties our hands. After five years, we have to either let the person go, fire them, the contractual employees, or we um, have to hire them on full time. And if we hire them on full time, as has been alluded to, that's going to have an impact based on whether or not they get health insurance currently. Uh, and whether or not they, and of course we have to pay for the retirement and things like that. And uh, I, I also just think it's it's not wise to do that. We're committing ourselves to doing that if this passes, because uh, yeah, as we as the finance committee made clear, our staff costs are growing faster than our revenue. And if we pass this, this is going to make that that even worse until we actually get a, a grapple on balancing out those two lines between the staff costs and the revenue. Uh, and so that's why at this point, I, I can't support this until I can uh, get, hear some more information that addresses those those concerns. And I, I think it'd be best to split this out, take the pension out as separate legislation. Can I, I, uh, Trisha, would you, Ms. Hopkins, did you want to respond to him? Yeah, I just wanted to respond to that because w one point that's really sensitive for us is that if we have employees that are long term and we're keeping them on an employment agreement, we are not recognizing that we need that as a not as a supplemental staff, but an actual staff person. And that gets us into some some difficulties, you know, in terms of of um, membership in the Maryland state retirement system. I mean, it's 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 not something we are, we're trying to avoid here. We're, we are trying to be uh, responsible and. Um, we do know that if we have individuals that are paid through grant funds and there's no permanence in that grant funding, that that's perfectly fine for us to keep those individuals continuing in that kind of, of um, employment relationship with us. And this, this legislation allows for that to occur as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to, I'm trying to clarify that we're not talking about a blanket change here and a, and a, and an always change. We we are being responsible and careful about how we're um, describing the employees that are affected by this. Okay, I don't. Thank you. I, think, I don't understand. Thank you for that, but I don't quite understand entirely what you're you're saying. So, are you saying that this isn't this wouldn't be a blanket change in terms of uh, our application on all contract employees? Or are you just, are you saying this would correct? So correct. Which contract so there's. Employees would There's, impact. Um, it I mean, would not, impact. not specific, but what type of employees? So those employees that are paid out of the general fund, um, you know what what you see in here is if they if they um, if their funding source is a grant, a grant that is not um, a, a continuous, always counted on uh, grant funding source, then those positions we would not move into. Uh, positions that could ultimately have permanent status. So this would impact contract employees paid out of the general fund. And can you say the second part again? That if an individual is paid through a grant source, that is a, uh, a lot of times a grant source has limits on it, has very specific language about what that grant is going to fund. And um, we we have written this legislation in such a way that we are not boxed into that position being converted because 
we can't control the grant source. If we if we converted such positions, we would probably have to bring in general fund money in order so, to support the parts of the grant is not going to cover. So that's that's why this legislation um, specifically identifies uh, positions that are, are grant funded as being the an exemption to the rule, the conversion rule. Would OEM be an example of that? In, in OEM's case, we're talking about uh, a very long history of grant source from the same grants. Mm -hmm. And so that would have to be part of the evaluation. Mm -hmm. So these positions that we're talking about are positions that are, let's say, important to the city. Uh, and we have been probably not treating our employees as fairly as we could have by keeping them in contract positions instead of making them permanent positions. Would that be accurate? Well, but for whatever reason, we have continued to keep positions in a contractual arrangement. We need to re-examine that. And that we have been doing that over time, and we have we have converted some and not con and cannot converted others. We're looking for codifying language that puts us in a position of consistency and expectation. Uh, Alderman, well, I'll let you say it, Alderman Arnett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I find this legislation to be extremely confusing and I'm afraid um, dealing with much more than what I thought it was dealing with. But let me ask you a very specific question. Um, are other excluded service employees only contract employees? No, other excluded service includes temporary seasonal employees as well. See, I mean, as you know, Sheila and I worked on the committee long ago to deal with contract employees. And I understand and subscribe to the policy that I think we're headed there, even recognizing Rob's concern that after five years, we may have to let them go um, or find some other way to employ them. But so much of this is other things, other things. that get into... Um, the uh, employee em agreement, employment agreement, employee means, and all of these things. And there's page after page of this, which I think are well outside of speaking about contract employees. And that's what I find so confusing and what makes me, quite frankly, ill disposed with moving forward with this legislation because I don't know what's dealing with contract employees and what's dealing with a whole host of other things. And quite frankly, my preference in drafting legislation, in fact, I'd like to get rid of that word, that clause, other stylistic changes, because that quite often feels to me like we're throwing in things that we want to get changed, but they don't have really anything directly connected to the purpose of the legislation. And that always makes me a little wary, but I am having a hard time page after page trying to sort out. I'm on top of page four. If an individual is found by the appointing authority to have knowingly made a false statement, I just don't see what that has to do with contract employees. That feels like it's a change for all employees. And I'd rather deal with changes for all employees in legislation that is dealing with all employees, not slipping it in here with what I thought was dealing with contract employees. And, uh, you know, I don't know uh, who I'm complaining to. I think I'm complaining to the drafters of the legislation, but that kind of stuff always makes me feel uncomfortable. So <clears throat> I'm trying to sort out the parts of this that have to do with how we're treating contract employees in the future. And I'm having a hard time doing that. I, I do think that the um, strikeouts with regard to false statements, that is something that 
when editing this, making edits to this section of, of the code, the Office of Law must have um, thought that was an inappropriate um, location for that part. And um, so I, I'm, I'm not gonna speak any further into that on their behalf. I think it's best that the Office of Law address that. But Ross, we have to necessarily have a good definition of what is a temporary seasonal employee in here as well, because um, what you may not realize and that we deal with on a daily basis is that when we're using, when we have uh, hourly limits on, that definitionally um, determine what somebody's available to receive in benefit structure, we've tried to account for that in our distinction between a temporary employee and somebody that necessarily needs to go on an employment agreement. So I'm, I'm sorry it sounds confusing, but it's kind of our daily world. <laughs> uh, no, and I, it, I and it does that. have a reason. It has a good reason. We also have um, some Maryland law that it's referred to as the sick and safe law, where if an employee works more than 106 days for us, so that then you've got that language in there, then they're entitled to receive an hour of this sick and safe leave for every 30 hours that they work. And so we've got all our systems working to account for that. We're just, just trying to kind of carve out our employee group so it's cleaner. And, and that um, when by reference somebody is hired into any of those categories, it's, it's, it's just a, a better understanding of what therefore they're going to be able to receive on a benefit and a leave basis. And I just voted um, absentee today where there are amendments on the ballot for the 150 hours and things like that. And that's actually what has made me a little more sensitive to this um, because that is something that is going on. And I actually had two constituents call me today and ask me to explain it to them and help them figure out how they should vote. And I'm thinking, I can tell you how I voted, but I can't tell you how to vote. But I don't know. Well, I, I can just... tell you having worked for the for the county that there are elements in their charters that requires that it appear as a as a charter amendment on the ballot in order to make any change. And and it's surprising what's in the charter and requires that kind of citizen involvement. But you know, we, we're not like that in the city. Um, we don't have that kind of uh, overlay here. But um, I just want to reassure you that we're not trying to give you very strange language here that we have controlling laws at the federal and the state level that we're trying to account for in in the way we have described and distinguished these employee groups. Um, thank you, Ms. Hopkins. I'm gonna have to, I'll, uh, Ms. Alderman Savage, uh, you have less than a minute. I'm getting a one minute a warning from <laughs> the staff, and that was probably 30 seconds ago. So uh, if you can be quick. I'll be less than 30 seconds. Yes, yeah, sorry. We adjourn. I, I, You're I, not I, even on this committee, but thank you anyway. Just to, I guess I need, I think bottom line is I feel like I need more. I hear what you're saying, Trisha, with, and I see that in, in the legislation where where this doesn't apply to the grant funded employees. Yeah. But I think I need to get a better understanding of, of, of what, just as as an example, like how many employees would this impact? Like how many, just going off of how many we have today, contract employees, how many would end up, assuming they're still employed after five years, how many will get shifted? Because that will give me an idea to understand, okay, here's the fiscal, the potential fiscal impact. I know some of those people will leave. We might get some new contract employees, you never know, but using what, what's written, what potentially would the impact be? And that's where I feel like we don't quite have all the information yet to be able to make a, 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 for a good decision right now. Yeah. Yeah, so, I, I don't know what you received through the budget process, but if you, you know, if you need to know what employees do we have that are in in the status now, that's, that's just a report. Okay. All right. I, Thank you very much. Um, they're going to cut us off like now. <laughs> so I'll, uh, we will bring this back uh, if we can 
I, is this on the agenda, Ms. Green, for Monday also? I will add it if that's what you want. Yes, on the uh, Monday. No, 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 no. Yes, <laughs> Monday night. Mm -hmm. It's on the, the council agenda for Monday? Yeah. Then you're going to have to put it on our agenda for Monday. Yep. Okay. And, and all the other things that we didn't get to today? No, they're not all. I know, what, 2010 is not on for Monday. Um, and what about uh, 3720? I don't know whether that's on either. Thank you. Ms. Green, can you tell me whether any of the other items? Um, I'll let you know. But all right. Okay. I, I believe it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so we'll have to have set aside at least two hours for Monday's meeting. So much for a, a quick meeting on Monday. <laughs> Thanks, Ross. Uh, <laughs> doing uh, my I'll duty. Oh, it, what'd you say? Just doing my duty. <laughs> so respectfully, does that include uh, this one as well? <laughs> okay. I'm afraid so. All right. So yes, yes. it is on um, the only committee it was going to was this one, 03720. Okay. So I'll look for the email. And, and okay. we can get the additional information from this, uh, from the finance department. I'll, department. I'll also prepare a fiscal, um, a list of the number of positions we have in their titles and their salaries as, as they currently stand and then uh, an estimate of what the extra cost would be for pension. It's hard to say on um, health benefits. If they've waived them currently, they may, if they were to be converted, they may decide to come on our benefits full time. So those kind of things are hard to estimate, but yeah. I'll, I'll provide yeah. what I can. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other questions um, for um, staff? Are we adjourning or suspending I'm, the meeting? I'm, oh, I, I guess we can adjourn, can't we, Ms. Green? We don't have anything pending. I mean, no legislation that's in the midst of action. Uh, so I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you very much, every, did I hear you guys vote? Aye. You just want the meeting to go on and on, and yeah, Julie right. cut us off. <laughs> Sorry.